Welcome to tonight's annual Mary Ann Hartman Awards Ceremony. I'm Joan Farini Mundy, the president of the University of Maine and our regional campus, the University of Maine at Machias. Recently, I was also named the vice chancellor of the University of Maine system for research and innovation. I'll begin tonight with the University of Maine land acknowledgement. The University of Maine recognizes that it is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of Penobscot people, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct, sovereign, legal, and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. Welcome to all to tonight's awardees, to Governor Mills, and to so many other distinguished people who are here with us virtually. Welcome to our campus, virtually, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this special evening. It's an honor to be together with people from across the university community, the state, and far beyond to recognize these three distinguished women, Sharon Barker, Molly and Dana, and Candace Powell. And it's especially meaningful to do so during Women's History Month. Dr. Mary Ann Hartman, a former University of Maine assistant professor and director of forensics, is a fitting namesake for these awards. She joined the UMaine faculty in 1969 after completing her PhD at Bowling Green University and became a pioneer in the field of oral interpretation, building on her background in speech communication and public address. Her work included oral autobiographies of Maine women born before 1900 and study of the use of oral interpretation to influence public policy. I located a paper of Dr. Hartman's comparing the conversational language of women and men born in Maine at about 1900. The paper was absolutely fascinating for many reasons, including that it drew on an interdisciplinary UMaine course on women of Maine. The course involved a women's historian, a folklorist, and a language expert. It's a great paper. In the conclusions, Professor Hartman notes, there is a traditional language of women. It is more evaluative flowery, more polite, more tentative, more qualified. I can't help but wonder what the results of a study conducted on people born in Maine more recently might reveal. This courageous teacher, scholar, advocate, friend, and mother died in 1980. So many of us here tonight never had the chance to meet her. But I do know that the women we are honoring exemplify the spirit, achievement, and zest for life that Dr. Hartman epitomized. Mary Ann Hartman Award was established in 1986 to recognize distinguished Maine women and their accomplishments in the arts, politics, business, education, and community service. The awardees are selected because they are an inspiration to others and demonstrate the levels of attainment now possible for women. That is certainly true of Sharon Barker, Molly and Dana, and Candace Powell. Presented annually, these awards increase campus and community awareness of the accomplishments of women today. The awards grew out of the Equity Leadership Program founded by Joanne Fritchie, who in 1973 became UMaine's first director of the Office of Equal Opportunity. She was a driving force to positively transform the UMaine campus and experience. Last month, we were fortunate that Joanne was the guest lecturer for the President's Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion's inaugural session for the Nine Pillars of Diversity Lecture Series. I inv invite you to listen to her fascinating and inspiring talk, during which she reminded us that she was hired at UMaine at a time when married women could not get a credit card without their husband's permission. I applaud tonight's awardees for also being driving forces for positive change. The, Ameri the Marianne Hartman Awards were originally hosted by the UMaine Women in the Curriculum Program, which in 2014 evolved into the Women's, Gender, and Sexualities Studies Program, a leading area for us today at the University of Maine. The program takes as a foundation that social constructions of gender affect everyone. WGS students and faculty examine how gender interacts with race, social class, ethnicity, disability, and other forms of diversity in our society. The paper I read, written by Professor Hartman 45 years ago, takes up some of those very interactions. Anne Schoenberger, a professor of mathematics, who was a founder and later director of the program, mentored me in my early career stages because of our shared interests in women in mathematics, long before I had any idea of coming to UMaine. At UMaine today, women's status is strong. 
Women comprise 49% of the student body, including 38% of students enrolled in the STEM fields, as well as 47% of faculty and 48% of administrators. We also know that in the larger society and at UMaine, much remains to be done. Research shows us that the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded challenges for women and racial and ethnic minority groups. The pandemic has deepened inequalities that exist, including with regard to health and economic security. The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Taylor, and so many others, as well as the horrific killings earlier this month in Atlanta of women of Asian descent, compel us to act. In June 2020, I appointed the President's Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to promote UMaine and UMaine Machias' commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, to advise campus leadership, and to report on institutional efforts and actions to ensure inclusive excellence. In December, the Council submitted a comprehensive report with 45 recommendations to address systemic racism and inequality. We're focused on prioritizing and instituting these recommendations so that we can move forward to a transformed culture with inclusion at the core. Back to tonight. This year is only the second in the 35-year history of the Marianne Hartman Awards that all three recipients are University of Maine alumni. So John Diamond, the University of Maine Alumni Association President and CEO, has offered to co-host this celebration and to include an awardee panel discussion about how their UMaine educations influence their lives of public service and activism. On behalf of the University of Maine, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program, and the Alumni Association, I thank and congratulate Sharon Barker, Molly and Dana, and Candace Powell for their extraordinary leadership and their impact and for being in Maine. And I thank each of them for being such wonderful models for all of us and for so many more. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Diamond. I'm the president and CEO of the University of Maine Alumni Association. We're pleased to be a co-host of tonight's celebration. As many of you know, the event was scheduled to take place in person in Orono a year ago. Unfortunately, but unavoidably, we weren't able to get together last March to celebrate the 2020 Mary Ann Hartman awardees. The in-person interaction between honorees and attendees has always been an enjoyable part of the event. And while YouTube is an inadequate substitute for face-to-face -face engagement, it does not in any way lessen the prestige of the awards nor the accomplishments of the award recipients. Dr. Mary Ann Hartman was a remarkable and respected champion of education, equal rights, human rights, and social justice. She was a determined advocate, and that's one of the many commonalities this evening's honorees share with her. All three, Sharon Barker, Molly and Dana, and Candace Powell, are tireless advocates, leaders, and difference makers. Maine is a better place because of their work. I should also note that all three honorees are UMaine graduates. So is Claudia Cummings, the 2020 recipient of the Sharon Barker Student Activist Award, which she will receive tonight. And the fifth honoree this evening is on her way to becoming a UMaine alumna. She's Neely Raymond, a current UMaine student whose 2020 high school essay will be recognized in a few moments. We are proud of all of tonight's award recipients each one models qualities, values, and attributes that we at the Alumni Association embrace and promote to use advocacy to advance educational opportunity, civic engagement, public policy, equity and inclusion, and social justice. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you for furthering the spirit and legacy of Dr. Mary Ann Hartman. Good evening, this is Laura Cowan speaking. I'm director of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program at the University of Maine. Our program initiated these awards in 1986 to honor Marianne Hartman, Associate Professor of Speech and Communications. There were very few women faculty members when Hartman was hired in 1969 and still few when she died in 1980. Reliable records of women faculty numbers at the University of Maine do not exist until the 1980s, 
but this graph of tenure track faculty and full professors at the University of Maine in 1984 reveals that women made up only 14% of the tenure track faculty and only 1.5% of the full professors. In the year that the Marian Hartman Awards were created, 1986, there were only four women full professors at the University of Maine. Sexism was common. Although there were talented women in many fields, women received little attention for their accomplishments and were rarely awarded prizes. For example, of the 85 Nobel Prizes for Literature awarded between 1901 and 1986, only six or 7% were awarded to women. Women fared only slightly better with the Nobel Peace Prize. Between 19 and 1901 and 1986, seven women, including Jane Addams and Mother Teresa, received a Nobel Peace Prize. Women lacked opportunity and recognition in the United States also. There were 966 Pulitzer Prizes for journalism in 14 categories between 1916 and 1986. 20 women, or 2%, re received these prizes. Mary Ann Hartman advocated for women because of their lack of opportunities and power. Because Hartman pointed out in 1973 that there were 420 faculty positions on university committees and only 19 women or 4% of the positions were held by women. Women faculty were appointed the following year to the Presidential Search Committee, the Grievance Committee, and the Council of Colleges Committee. In 1986, a group of faculty from the Women in the Curriculum Program inaugurated the Marian Hartman Awards in order to increase campus and community awareness of women's issues and women's abilities, which would result in opportun advancing opportunities for all. It worked. I am delighted to welcome you to the recognition of the 2021 winners of the Marianne Hartman Award. My name is Emily Haddad. As Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Maine, I am proud to work at a university that values the study of women, gender, and sexuality, and that promotes the leadership of women. A university that values the achievements of women as activists and advocates, as professionals, as people who have, nevertheless, persisted. Because they have persisted, doggedly and creatively, they have improved the world we all share. In these especially challenging times, these women remind us of the promise that the future can be better than the present. The annual granting of Marianne Hartman Awards is an important moment. It prompts us to reflect, together, on what can be accomplished by women who stick to their principles, by women who notice problems and commit themselves to addressing them. The opportunity to recognize the inspiring work of such women is Mary Ann Hartman's enduring gift. With great pleasure, I invite you to join me in celebrating Hartman Award recipients Sharon Barker, Molly and Dana, and Candace Powell. Thank you for being here today. Hello, this is Governor Janet Mills. Soon we may all be together again, I hope, but in the meantime, it's my honor to join you virtually to celebrate Candace Powell, Molly and Dana, Sharon Barker, and the contributions that strong women like them have made to the state of Maine every day. One of the traditions of the Marianne Hartman uh, Award Ceremony has been the remarks from a past recipient on what the recognition means to the women who receive it. This year, I'm honored to share with you a few of my reflections. 
five years after I was honored to receive the Marianne Hartman Award. By celebrating high-achieving Maine women, the Marianne Hartman Award inspires the next generation of women leaders to accomplish great things. And since the awards were first handed out 35 years ago, we have made such great progress in advancing the equality of women and girls in Maine. Almost half of the Maine legislature now are women. More than half of my cabinet are women. Nine out of 15 cabinet members, women, strong, intelligent, forward-looking women on whom I rely every day for wise counsel. We have so much to celebrate. We also have a long way to go. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed some unacceptable inequities in our society. And women, people of color, and women of color in particular have been most harmed during this pandemic. I am committed to leading Maine through a recovery that results in a more welcoming state, a state that better serves and supports all people to realize their full potential. I thank you for your partnership in this important work. And tonight we celebrate individuals, but ultimately we're celebrating a community of strong women across the state, some well-known to us and others quietly leading in their own way, in their homes, in their workplaces, in their own communities, and others who respect them and follow them, cheer from them, and are willing to learn from them. It is because of the growing strength of that community that I am more optimistic, more optimistic than before about our future. And I congratulate Candace Powell, Molly and Dana, and Sharon Barker on this well-deserved honor. I thank the University of Maine for carrying on Marianne Hartman's legacy of celebrating distinguished women leaders in Maine. Thank you. WGS program also, of course, recognizes and encourages student achievement. Tonight, we have two award winners. The Sharon Barker Student Activism Award annually honors a current University of Maine student who exemplifies a passion and commitment to human welfare and social change. The 2020 award went to Claudia Cummings, who was a senior in social work. 
community engagement, while at UMaine, included the Wabanaki Center, the Take Back the Night event, New Education Women's Leadership Program, the Red Cross, Maine Health Equity Alliance, Planned Parenthood, and the State of Maine's Legislature's Health and Human Services Committee. She has also shown courage in the face of injustice and at risk of herself in initiating a Bureau of Indian Affairs investigation into police abuse of power. Our other student prize winner won a scholarship while in high school. In 2019, WGS graduate assistant Amy Coleman oversaw the University of Maine's Mary Ann Hartman High School Feminist Essay Contest. I am happy to report that Neely Raymond, who won the scholarship for an essay on Edna St. Vincent Millay, is now a successful English major at the University of Maine. English professor Caroline Bix reports that Neely is not only an exceptional writer and thinker, she is a generous and optimistic presence. I worried about teaching Shakespeare virtually, but Neely's Introduce Yourself to the Class video gave me hope. In a mere two minutes, she reassured us that she had enjoyed her Zoom discussions in her previous classes, put in a plug for the Performing Arts Department's um, production of Twelfth Night, and introduced us to her puppy, Mitzi. You will also hear from Neely. In high school, I knew I wanted my career to be something that would allow me to make a difference in the world, whether it be local, state, or national. While in college, I felt the need to just leave the state and explore the city life that would be full of new experiences and diversity. Just over two years ago, I started working for my community's daycare, the Penobscot Nation Child Care Center. This position pulled me back into my own community where I learned the importance of local activism. Since then, I've gained a lot from the University of Maine and especially from the School of Social Work. There, I was pushed to look at my own biases and strengths, but most importantly, I gained a mentor, Professor Dr. Robin Russell, who has pushed me to do things I never thought were possible. She pushed me to apply to attend the Maine National Education for Women's Leadership, where I met several amazing people around the state. Robin also pushed me to do my senior field placement with former state senator Jeffrey Gratwick, where I learned the ways of the Maine legislature. Robin asked me to manage her campaign this past summer while she ran for the State House of Representatives for District 103. We learned together how to run a campaign and how to engage with constituents during a global pandemic. This past summer, Robin encouraged me to run for the Penobscot Nation Tribal Council. I didn't think I would win because of my age and life and experience, but to my surprise, my motivation, new perspective, and community engagement paid off. I was elected to the Penobscot Nation Tribal Council August 12th of 2020. I won the Shannon Baker Student Activism Award in March of 2020 for participating in activities such as volunteering in the 2016 election for the referendum for tighter gun laws in the state of Maine, protesting former President Donald Trump at his Bangor rally, and volunteering for Planned Parenthood and the Red Cross. I continue to engage in political activism, such as running for tribal council, and just in the past month, I testified in front of the Joint Standing Committee of State and Local Government in support of LD2, an act to require the inclusion of racial impact statements in the legislative process. I can promise you that I will continue to address social, racial, economic, and environmental justice. My name is Neely Raymond. Uh, in 2019, I attended the Mary Ann Harmon Awards as the winner of the high school essay contest. It was remarkable to sit alongside women who have demonstrated both the greatest altruism and the greatest loyalty to themselves. And it was remarkable to speak with Governor Janet Mills. 
Today, I am an English and Philosophy double major at UMaine, and the Marianne Hartman Awards is a large reason why. I thank those who organized this essential event, and I congratulate the 2021 honorees, Sharon Barker, Molly and Dana, and Candace Powell. I have a younger sister, and it is beautiful that she will be able to look up to these main women and so realize her own power. Good evening. This is WGS Director Laura Cowan. As you have heard from Governor Mills' remarks, the Marion Hartman Awards have become a main tradition. Our ranks are diverse and include novelist poet Mae Sarton, opera singer Eileen Farrell, Olympic gold medalist Joan Benoit Samuelson, basket maker Mary Mitchell Gabriel, biologist and climate scientist Esperanza Sancioff, women's health advocate Ruth Lockhart, native youth advocate Denise Altvater, journalist Alicia Anstead, environmentalist Judy Kellogg Markowski, Somali activist Fatuma Hussein, and Penobscot cultural heritage activist Maria Shiru. But just as important as the recognition of individuals and their accomplishments, the Marianne Hartman Awards have created a precious community. We are all drawn together annually by our shared commitment to elevating women, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our community is bipartisan, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, interdenominational, and interdisciplinary. The values that we all share energize and cement a remarkable community that many highly prize. The variety of our community reflects our academic program. Our new name, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, points to our new approach, which is intersectional. People do not have singular identities. Intersectionality refers to the simultaneous experience of categorical and hierarchical classifications, including, but not limited to, race, class, gender, disability, sexuality, and nationality. It also refers to the fact that what is often perceived as disparate forms of oppression, like racism, classism, sexism, or xenophobia, are actually mutually dependent and intersecting in nature, and they compose a unified system of oppression. Our program's intersectional perspective is a context for our celebration of our three awardees. Marian Hartman awardees' achievements cannot be denied. The challenges that still face us are also undeniable. The coronavirus pandemic and its consequent economic crisis have revealed not cracks, but indeed fissures in our social fabric. Different populations have been disproportionately affected by the hardships. According to the CDC, African Americans compared with all other racial ethnic groups are more likely to contract the coronavirus, be hospitalized for it, and die of the disease. This disproportionate rate of coronavirus deaths occurs during a sustained period of police violence against Black people. Between 2015 and 2020, Black Americans, who account for less than 13% of the U.S. population, were killed by police at more than twice the rate of white Americans. Hispanic Americans are also killed by police at a disproportionate rate. Women have been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus crisis. Although previous economic downturns hit working men hardest, working women are currently experiencing the worst effects of the COVID-19 recession. 
80% of all employees who left their jobs in January were women. Women's role in the workforce is now at a 30-year low. Last week's murders in Atlanta of eight people, including six Asian American women, made palpable the growing number of acts of discrimination and hate crimes against Asian Americans. Between March 19, 2020 and February 28, 2021, there were 3,800 reported incidents of anti-Asian hate crimes, nearly 70% of which targeted Asian American women. I raise these issues not to depress or discourage you, but rather to insist on their urgency. The urgency around human rights, health and race demands attention. And that is our goal with tonight's panel of the 2020 Marian Hartman Awards winners. The 2020 award winners do not represent the range or variety possible for awardees. They all have careers distinguished by public service, civic engagement, and activism. In three crucial contemporary domains, health advocacy, gender and women's rights, and race relations. Our 2020 Mary Ann Hartman awardees are participating in a panel discussion of their careers of public service devoted to social justice, a subject which could not be more pressing. Three individuals who nominate, nominated these awardees will provide short introductions to their accomplishments and then former Marianne Hartman Award winner and leader in education, leadership, child advocacy, and politics, the Honorable Mary Cathcart will moderate the panel. Thank you for joining us. I'm so very honored to introduce Molly and Dana to you today. I first met Molly in several years ago when she was talking with a group of Leonard Middle School students in Old Town. So impressed with the honest, authentic, and compassionate message she shared with students about her journey as an activist, I followed her to the parking lot and asked if she might be available that day later to meet with a group of Orno Middle School students I was working with through Operation Breaking Stereotypes. And because Molly Ann is who she is, she said, sure, what time? And that was the beginning of my understanding that Molly and Dana is not only firmly anchored in her advocacy for Native American people, but also a believer in the importance of keeping the paths of communication open in order to build understanding of how Native people have been connected to and caretakers of place, physically and culturally, for centuries. Raised on Indian Island, Mollian has been able to take all that she learned within her community and share that information with the wider world through her activism. As she says, I learned early on to speak my truth. As early as her high school days, she recognized the importance of educating communities about the harm that using Native American mascots can bring to both Native American and non-Native American communities through stereotyping. Fast forwarding to today, as the first appointed Penobscot Nation Ambassador, Molly Ann continues her journey of advocacy and action for Native American issues, including, but not limited to, land use, water use, and tribal sovereignty, violence against Native American women, and the eradication of the use of Native American mascots and replacing Columbus Day with a holiday that honors the indigenous communities present thousands of years before European contact. In her first year as Penobscot Nation Ambassador, she realized two of her long-term goals. The Maine legislature voted in 2019 to ban the use of Native American mascots in public schools, and on April 26, 2019, Governor Janet Mills signed legislation that replaced Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Three years ago, Molly and Dana's portrait, painted by artist Robert Shetterly, joined over 200 other courageous citizens in Shetterly's Americans Who Tell the Truth project. The quotation etched onto the portrait captures the essence of Molly and's courageous and compassionate spirit. And I quote, There is a power in unity. 
When tribal nations are seen as sovereign bodies, we can work together toward a better relationship with other governments. When cities and towns celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, a foundation of trust and understanding can be created. And when we are seen as people and not stereotypes or mascots, we can build on a shared humanity. It is truly all about respect. Most recently, Molly and Dana is president of the newly formed Wabanaki Alliance, whose mission is to build political power and educate Maine residents on the need for full recognition of tribal sovereignty. Her journey as an activist and voice for American, Native American people across our country has been guided by the wisdom of her elders, but ultimately is driven by Malian's commitment to the well-being of indigenous nations. In closing, I would be remiss without mentioning a dimension of Malian's being that I know she holds as perhaps her most important role, that of being a mother to her two amazing children. In my Operation Breaking Stereotypes work, I have had the wonderful opportunity to get to know her daughters and can say unequivocally that Mollyan has modeled for and taught them to be courageous and compassionate young women and activists. With pleasure, I introduce to you Mollyan Dana. My name is Michael Eckhart and I'm Emeritus Vice President at the University of Maine. On behalf of myself, Dr. James Van Kirk, former head of palliative care at Eastern Maine Medical Center, and Wayne Melanson, former volunteer coordinator of hospice of Eastern Maine, I'm pleased to introduce you to Candace Powell. Candace received her nursing education at the University of Maine and University of Southern Maine and practiced nursing in Maine from 1969 to 1984. Thereafter, she committed herself to hospice and end-of-life care in Maine. In addition, she's been appointed by Maine governors to advise on AIDS, prevention of adolescent suicide and self-destructive behavior, and implementation of the medical marijuana statute. She was also a subcommittee member of the Task Force on Aging for the Maine Speaker of the House and was appointed by the Maine Attorney General to the Community Advisory Committee for Maine Health Access Foundation. She's been a member of the Maine Bioethics Network, the Maine Association of Nonprofits, and board member of ALS. She's frequently asked for advice by the Maine's federal delegation. Candace Powell has been instrumental in establishing and developing end-of-life care for the state of Maine. She's achieved this by innovation, advocacy, education, collaboration, and mentorship. She's developed critical partnerships and is a tireless advocate for the underserved. For example, the inmates at the Maine State Prison. For over 15 years, Candace was involved with a hospice inmate volunteer program, including training and supervision of the inmates. She's also assisted Maine programs for veterans and those afflicted with ALS. She's a frequent speaker and organizer of workshops, over, 400, or over 225, in Maine and throughout the U.S. on topics related to end-of-life care. She co-drafted the Maine Hospice Licensure Bill. She's been the executive director of the Maine Hospice Council and Center of End-of-Life Care since 1992, which is funded annually by the Maine State Legislature out of general funds. She's an active advocate for palliative care and for physician orders for life-sustaining treatment or pulse. Candace Powell has devoted herself to discussing death, dying, and bereavement in Maine, the nation, and internationally. These are topics that most of us are uncomfortable discussing, but will touch every single one of us. Thanks to Candace for providing a forum for these discussions in Maine especially for the underserved. It has been a personal privilege to know and work with Candace Powell, and she exemplifies a recipient of the Marianne Hartman Award. Hello, everyone. I'm Susan McKay, Director of the Maine Center for Research in STEM Education at the University of Maine and a professor of physics here. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Sharon Barker, a wonderful colleague and friend, and one of the recipients being honored here with the 2020 Marianne Hartman Award. 
Sharon epitomizes both the inspiration and the achievement recognized by this award. I got to know Sharon when she was the director of the Women's Resource Center at the University of Maine. She and I have had parallel and very cross-linked careers for decades and many wonderful, wonderful conversations. She always brought expertise and understanding to the world in which I have taught and conducted research. The world of women faculty in an underrepresented field, such as my academic home, physics and astronomy. Sharon in her career has contributed to women and girls' lives in so many ways. She's been a leader in women's health, in supporting women at the University of Maine and in other workplaces, in opening non-traditional career opportunities for women, and in helping girls build their sense of strength and independence, setting the stage for future accomplishment. Long before community engagement became a common topic of conversation on campuses, Sharon was building the networks and convening the groups to bring together problem solver solvers across stakeholder communities. She understands that inequities toward women need to be addressed at a systemic level, not by retraining individual women in how to cope with them. There is no job description that can capture Sharon's reach and understanding around these issues. She has brought to her work holistic knowledge of our healthcare, our safety, our work, and how they are all connected. She has always been a visionary in this field, respected by and often far out ahead of national leaders. For example, she was one of the first to recognize the patterns of treatment received by women faculty in underrepresented fields. The isolation, but also high visibility combination that is so prevalent and so challenging. As the Women's Resource Center director, she always spoke eloquently and convincingly of the interwoven, multifaceted aspects of gender work. She connected the data and the stories using her influence to build a diverse and powerful team of advocates and refusing to take the easy popular route of promoting a single isolated activity as the solution. The pandemic has shown us that the inequities and challenges for women are still to be solved. Sharon, with all that she has accomplished, inspires us to bring a renewed commitment and passion to issues of gender equity within our own sphere of influence. We cannot fall into complacency about this work since there is so much left to do. I extend to her my sincere congratulations as her accomplishments are recognized through this distinguished award. And I look forward to hearing her thoughts in the upcoming panel.
very strongly about it. There was nothing I could really do about it. So I marched. And out of that activism, I got more and more inclined to be active. You know, I went on to learn draft counseling to help advise people who wanted to avoid the war. And what I learned is that it gave me a great deal of satisfaction to feel that I was working on something larger than myself, contributing to the future, uh, making society better. And then the personal rewards of being an activist is you just meet the greatest people when you do this work. You know, the people with the creative spirits and the smart ideas and the really uh, developing a vision of something that perhaps has never existed before in our society. And that's, what, that's really heady stuff. It really uh, uh, is very satisfying to be part of a movement and to have those relationships. The people that are activists are such a cross section. I mean, they, they come from all walks of life. They contribute a lot of whatever skills they have available. For me, I think that my contribution and skill was in my problem solving ability and my networking and being able to connect people with good ideas. And, and, and I think that once I got into it, I just, I just couldn't imagine a life without it. I mean, it's something that it, it adds such an amazing dimension to your experience that I think it just keeps you going. And, and, and certainly it didn't feel like I had a choice when I got started. I felt driven because I felt so strongly about what was going on. And that feeling of, of responsibility uh, persisted uh, throughout my career. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, I think, is that everybody can be an activist and everybody is to some extent. Some people it's very, uh, uh, just kind of being the worker behind the scenes, uh, to be taking a leadership position. I felt incredibly privileged to be able to earn my living by being a social activist and at the University of Maine, which is one of the most stimulating places I've ever been. So um, it was just a, a combination of feeling like it was something I had to do. Um, it made me feel better about myself. It made me feel like more a part of the community. Um, sorry to hold it up, but please answer the question now. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I'll echo, you know, what Candace started off saying that I, I'm super honored to be here and among these amazing women leaders, um, Mary Cathcart included for sure. It's great to see you all. And, and I'm so happy to be able to help celebrate uh, tonight. Uh, a lot of great things have already been said about the rewards of activism and living your life in a way that you're kind of constantly promoting positive change. I think an important thing to remember is that none of this comes about easily. These systems that we're trying to, you know, infiltrate and make better have been formed over generations. So we aren't going to be able to dismantle them and make them work for everybody overnight. And I think what really keeps you going and the ultimate reward is seeing progress and seeing things get better for the next generation. As Connie so beautifully talked about, my daughters are 12 and 14. So thinking about the work that I've done will make their life easier is a huge reward. They get to go to high school in a state that has banned uh, Indian mascots that are harmful to their well being. And that's a huge reward for me. I also think part of it is thinking about the generations of people, indigenous people and women that came before me that were silenced and, and weren't able to speak out and were so oppressed and restricted in so many areas of their life that I really owe it to them to honor their sacrifices uh, by speaking up often and trying to affect change whenever I can. Thank you, that's, that's great. Um, the next question is probably a short answer question and we do think the, the audio is improving. So talk louder. Talk louder <laughs> for all of us to talk louder. Uh, the next question is, please tell us about another woman leader whom you admire or who inspired you and how that person impacted your career. Sharon, you start here. 
Okay. Um, well, that has to be Mabel Wadsworth. Um, Mabel hired me. I was driving taxi in Bangor um, at, you know, $4 a day, basically, when I applied for a job at family planning. And Mabel interviewed me and told me later that I really wasn't the right person for the job, but she thought I belonged in the field and it was the only job she had. So she was going to hire me and then put me in a different job as soon as she had one available. And that's what she did. I started in family planning and I worked for 10 years in family planning and I moved very quickly from an outreach worker to a, a clinical worker, uh, working under the first nurse practitioner in the state that was trained to do nurse practitioner work, thanks to Mabel. Then 10 years later when um, the pol politics were getting really difficult for family planning, Mabel and I and and Terry DeRosier and Ruth Lockhart and Phil Worden decided we needed a nonprofit feminist health center in the area. And so we set about to create the Mabel Wadsworth Center. And Mabel graciously um, allowed us to use her name uh, because not only did it bring a great deal of prestige, but a lot of her values about the importance of women's community and uh, the empowerment of women were really standards that we wanted to achieve in the in the development of that. So Mabel was a close friend and mentor for a long, long time, and and uh, I really am grateful that she hired me, even though probably wasn't the smartest thing uh, for the job that was available. <laughs> Great, Sharon. I'm, I'm glad I I knew Mabel later on in her life, and she was incredible. Amalian, next for you. Yes, this is a great question. And I couldn't pick just one, so I picked three, but I'll be quick. <laughs> and uh, the first person I thought of was my great aunt, Donna Loring, who served as a tribal representative to the legislature, along with being a Vietnam War veteran, a tribal council member, most recently uh, a tribal liaison to the governor's office. And she invited me to testify on bills as a teenager. And I remember seeing the legislative process working and, and seeing her you know, working very hard to try to make things better in our state for indigenous people. The second would be my grandmother, Elizabeth Sockbeeson, who worked in the tribe for uh, all of her career. She raised eight children and uh, I, she was an elected tribal council member as well. And I got to serve on tribal council with her in her last term. And she just continues to inspire me. She cares so much about our community. And the third uh, is my mom, Julia Sofbeeson. And I know that she's watching tonight. So I just want to really thank her. Uh, my mother is a Dartmouth graduate. She has been a teacher in our community, just a very thankless job. Uh, she's worked so hard educating the kids of the Penobscot Nation for 20 something years uh, while raising the four of us as a single mother. So they all really exemplified compassion and strength and how to give back constantly. <laughs> Wonderful. Candice, who is the woman you think of? I think you're muted, Candice. As with Molly and it was hard to choose one um, so I'm going to list a couple uh, and then focus on one in particular. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, I think, was someone that gave me such inspiration for her time, for her position, and what she was able to accomplish because she was confident about herself and stepped out of a comfort zone that a lot of women would have stayed within and really made a name for herself and affected uh, the human rights perspective internationally or through the UN. Uh, another woman is Harriet Tubman. Um, she also was a great inspiration to me. I read a lot of books about her and I read a lot anyway. And I just could not imagine the courage it took to step forward and do what that woman did um, on behalf of so many others. I had a lot of teachers too who 
uh, were inspirations, but in a very circuitous way. Um, and But I've always told my students that you can learn a lot more sometimes when things don't go well. And when people tell you certain things that hurt you to your core, because it's not always, you, you always don't remember what someone said or what someone did, but you do remember how they made you feel. And when you become an adult, you do not want to make other people feel that way, if at all possible. So I learned a lot in a very circuitous way from some of my teachers. But the one person that I think I learned the most from, and not someone older than I am, but someone younger than I am, and that's my daughter. And I mentioned her because she taught me so many things when she was growing up. She taught me how to be a better mother. She taught me how to be a fierce advocate for young people. She taught me really the rudiments of advocacy work. Although as a young person, I uh, did a lot of it in high school. So, but my daughter, I want to recognize her and I hope she's listening right now because she has such a strong spirit, such tenacity. She's a very bright young lady and a lot of her friends look to her for comfort and support because she has such an incredible spirit and I want to thank her. Those are all wonderful answers and there are so many women that uh, we all admire. I could certainly name them off and would have trouble you know, narrowing that down to one or two or three. Uh, we are going to ask, because of, in the interest of time, and we want to leave time at the end for questions and answers from the audience today. So if you can try to hold your answer down to one piece of advice that you would offer to other women seeking to make meaningful social change and everybody uh, take about no more than three minutes if we can, because we have a few other questions and we really want to leave time for others to throw their questions at us. So Sharon, would you like to take off on that one? Um, same piece of advice I always give is uh, embrace contradictions, um, pay close attention to seemingly contradictory ideas and truths. Um, activism has to do with power, redistribution of power. Nobody gives up power voluntarily. Uh, and, and frequently people look for simple answers to very complex questions. And a lot of the questions we're trying to solve are unique to our time. And so we really have to think outside the box. Um, everyone believes in their own sincerity. And so I also encourage people to beware of good intentions because people tend to think of things within their, the context of their own lives. Uh, and many of the problems we face today are systemic. And it isn't just one simple factor that we need to worry about. So listening to people who are, who are potential allies or even adversaries to see if there's any common ground, to see what the issues are, but to, but to beware of the tyranny of nice and kind. It's good to be kind, but it's not good to be uh, as Oprah would put it, um, um, the need to please disease. Uh, we need to stand up for what's important. We need to speak our truth. Um, people do not distinguish between individuals and systems. And that makes it very, very difficult to get into a complex conversation. But it is the complex situations, uh, conversations that we need to have in order to figure out what we have to do. So. That's what I say, embrace contradictions and beware of good intentions. Thank you, Sharon. Candice? Oh, so I usually don't, uh, don't give advice, but I offer suggestions. So that's what I will do here. And I, will, I would encourage anybody who's interested in getting into social change work to be patient to not allow ego to get in the way of doing the altruistic work that we all need to um, 
understand and value, to learn how to be a good problem solver. Do not avoid conflict. Conflict can be very rewarding if it's handled properly. Be present, really present for the people in the communities that you're working with and learning from. And always be a student of theirs. Do not imply that you are coming in to fix anything for anyone else. You must be um, able to listen and listen carefully and not necessarily to the people that some people might put you in touch with, but for the people on the ground. Everyday people, real people, people that are struggling because what I've learned about life myself has come from my patients and from people in underserved and disenfranchised communities that have allowed me to come in to their space and their community and learn and listen from them. Wonderful. Molly, and what advice would you offer? One piece of advice to other women seeking to make the kind of social change that you have been making I think um, speaking your truth in a way that connects with others around shared humanity is something that I found is really effective. Human beings are all driven by a few very universal things. And when you can find ways to connect on that with people, even people that you may disagree with, um, that's really powerful and uplifting. I would also say one big part of activism that I wish I could tell a younger me is to take care of yourself, um, to be healthy in mind, body, and spirit. And that's when you are at your best doing this very important work to uplift your community and everybody else. Great advice. We're going to ask one more question and then we will see if we have questions uh, submitted yet from the audience. Here we go. This is only the second time since the Marianne Hartman Awards inception that all three awardees have been University of Maine alums. Today's event is also a tribute to the University of Maine. Can each of you reflect upon your education at UMaine and explain what features of that education were significant for you or contributed to your extraordinary accomplishments? We'll let can this go first? Thank you. Um, when I think of my, I spent two years at the University of Maine on the Orono campus and then two years, two and a half years really in Portland at Maine Medical Center for my nursing career. But when I was at, on campus in Orono, I remember an English teacher I had. His name was Mr. Newell. And he was a very understated gentleman. And I took a creative writing course from him. And I remember the first paper I did, he, when I passed it in and got it back, he uh, put a note at the top of the page and he said, this was good, but, and he wrote this note for me that says, always speak about something that's in your heart and soul and spirit. When you do that, you will never go wrong. And so the next paper I did for him, I spoke about the little town my sister and I were living in. My, our dad um, ran a business in town and all of the locals in town used to come in to the business. And I wrote about them and I wrote about what it was like living in a little town. And I passed that paper in and he wrote a note on the top of it when he gave it back to me with an A plus. And he said, this is what I mean. And what I guess I'm inferring by that is that when you have a passion and are mission driven about something that you know from the inside out that that is what comes through. It's not just conceptual, it's not just theoretical. 
it is really what drives you. And I think with activism and advocacy and social change work, that is what you need to embody. When you try to do something that is something else somebody asks you to do that you really don't know well, um, then it doesn't come across as genuine. Molly Anna uh, mentioned being genuine. And I think that's, that's such a critical, critical um, piece of what I learned from the university system. Yeah. Thank you, Candace. Sharon, can you answer that? <laughs> Sharon, I think you're muted. There we go. Um, I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Maine. Um, it, was, it was a very critical experience for me. I was an immigrant. I, my family had moved to the United States from Canada when I was eight years old and I grew up in University County. And it just increased my exposure to so many things, um, made me braver. Um, taught me critical thinking skills. I remember directly um, when Bud Schoenberger in Current World Problems, I felt like, oh my God, I, I don't know what's going on in the world. I just realized that I, I hadn't been able to question authority or think things through. And it made a big difference in my, uh, just the way I saw the world and the way I saw myself in it. I got my master's degree, um, because I left family planning and came back to develop some specific skills actually to set up Maple Wadsworth Center. So I studied uh, public administration. I based all of my, all of my papers were about things that I needed to learn in order to do that, if it was the assignment or not. Um, I, I uh, surveyed 40 feminist health centers around the country just to find out how they did it as a, as a basis for my thesis. And it really gave me both the time and the academic support to do that project. And then, of course, I worked at the university for 25 years. So it was an ongoing, um, lifelong learning experience, um, stimulating environment connections with really interesting people and, and had a major impact on my life. Leon? Yes, um, so I can probably point to, to one very specific thing. And uh, the year I graduated uh, in 2006, I was awarded the Margaret Chase Smith Center for Public Policy uh, Scholarship. And I was able to do a large paper and project on policy, you know, opportunities or potential um, policy making around Indian mascots. And that was kind of the through line in my career thus far where I was able to combine activism with my new role uh, for in tribal government around public policy. And of course we were able to pass the law last year banning those mascots in Maine. So um, I was really thankful for you Maine Orono for giving me that opportunity to really dive into this. And it you know just set me up very well to keep looking into this in my career. And of course, being able to go to school at Orono, which is ancestral territory for the Penobscot Nation was very significant for me as well. Thank you. Laura, do we have any questions? Um, okay. No, we're waiting to hear some questions. So if anyone is interested and asking these panelists or one particular panelist a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, maybe, uh, Mary, could you ask number four now? Yes, I, I have another question here that we had left out so that there'd be more time for other people to ask. How does your identity as a woman influence you as an advocate, ally, or leader? Does your gender inform your work or the choices you make? Sharon? On mute, okay. Well, I think that um, gender is such a major part of who we are and how we define ourselves. Uh, for me, the challenge was to identify those characteristics that are truly me and who I am as opposed to traits that are imposed on me by society's expectations. 
and being able to sort out and and uh, take on those things that feel positive and and reject those things that don't. So I I think it's really important to stay true to oneself. I always used to tell students um, put on a good front, grow into it. You know, the more confident you act, the more the people will treat you differently, and you will develop confidence in that interaction. And I think that's really important. I also think it's important to note that men and women are both very important uh, parts of the change that we need to see, but the mission and what we need to do with men and women are very different. Um, I think women need to be able to claim their ego and to be and claim their confidence and men need to figure out ways to nurture their more uh, sensitive part of themselves and just step aside. Um, and so it was really uh, very important for me in my work uh, to figure out those intersections with men and women. And I really enjoyed working with both men and women, but I, I think that the uh, challenges in doing gender-based work is very different uh, for men and women. It was, it's been amazingly rewarding for me my entire life. Thanks, Sharon. Marlion, has being a woman influenced you as an advocate? Absolutely. And like I mentioned before, I've had some really strong female role models. So I do believe I've had to work harder in my field and my career because I am a woman. But I had a great, I had such great examples to look to that I didn't realize I was working harder, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Uh, I just knew that success took hard work. And now that I'm a little bit further along, I can see that, you know, there are specific barriers that we need to get over that take longer than if we were men. Um, but all the work that we are doing is making it so much easier for our daughters uh, to come. And I, you know, really cherish the the strong female leaders in my tribe and around the state and i feel that um you know with vice president harris taking office last year or this year it's been so um so great to see a woman of color in such a high place of representation for women like me thanks molly and, and candace has your gender influenced your work or the choices you've made over the years well, I, to be honest, I, I haven't thought about that very much. And when I saw the question, I, I thought that was an interesting question. I guess for myself, um, maybe it's the way women are socialized. But having said that, all women aren't socialized the same, just like all men aren't socialized the same. So I guess what I look for in men and women are the gifts and potential they have to be nurturers, to be kind, to be sensitive, to, to be strong advocates, to um, all of those qualities. I guess what I'm saying is I look for the emotional intelligence in people, no matter their agenda. I, I just feel very grateful that I wasn't bashful about uh, leading with and, and entering a, a challenging feel like social change uh, because I was a woman. I felt that as a woman, I had a lot to bring to that with my own um, skills of nurturing and advocacy and, and confidence in, in what I was doing. So I, I really feel that as Molly Ann said, that women, when they enter a challenging field and become advocates, that they also see in real time the challenges that women have. Um, and I use as an example, my 18 years working at the prison, uh, when I entered there uh, the first day, um, that many years ago, I realized that that was an environment, and this was the max, the men's uh, state prison in Warren. I realized that that was not an environment that was too endearing, um, or uh, lent itself to be too endearing for women who wanted to do some social change work. So 
I learned a lot about myself, what I could bring to that environment and how necessary the nurturing side of me was in that environment to help people learn that they also have that side of them in the, themselves. And the transformation that I saw with many of the men who were in my classes over 18 years was quite phenomenal. So I understood right then that some of the qualities that I as a woman had were um, that balanced side from what some of their histories had been. So in that environment, eventually it was a very, very, very rewarding um, 18 years for me. Thank you all for those answers. Uh, they'll be wonderful to pick up pieces from what you said and answer those questions, that question uh, about your experiences at UMaine, and I'm sure you'll be used in some future publicity <laughs> that they have. Laura, did we have any yes, questions? Yes, yep, we do have some questions. Um, so we have a couple and I'll give you the first. It is um, similar to one of others we've had. It says, what is the one piece of advice you would give your younger self? <laughs> so think of yourself and yes. Who wants to answer that? right away <laughs> um, I'll try to keep it to activism because I could think of a, a few things I would tell my younger self <laughs> in, a, in a larger sense but I, I think I would just say it, it's not failure you just haven't succeeded yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah great Candice or Sharon? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to jump in here. Um, the one piece of advice that, that I didn't realize until latter years, and actually it came to me in a dream, and it was a dog that my sister and I had who had been hit by a car um, right in front of us, and um, the dog kept following me, and I ran away. And many years later, that dog came to me in a dream and I sat right up in bed because the dog had just said to me, in your life going forward, I do not want you ever to be afraid of anything anymore. And I guess that's what I would say to my younger self, do not be afraid. There is always a reason behind what you see. And I am forever grateful. My sisters and my dog was named Rennie. Oh, what a great story, Candace. Thank you for that. Sharon, do you? Oh, you're muted, Sharon. Not in here. There we go. Um, I don't know. That's a tough one because every time I come up with an idea, I think of the opposite. You know, I think, you know, uh, it would be nice if I had been more patient. Uh, but on the other hand, I think my impatience served me well in many ways. Um, being able to see, see the long view. Um, but again, uh, you know, it's a step-by-step -step process, you know, and you just have to jump, jump into the river wherever it is and, and, uh, and do what you can. Um, maybe be braver, but I think I was as brave as I could be, <laughs> you know, so I, it's really hard to say. I, I, I know that I am embracing getting older um, and, and the wisdom that that comes uh, with age. Um, and then there's the bodily deterioration that makes it kind of challenging. But um, so I, I, don't, I don't really know. I feel pretty good. I wish uh, life were longer. I got a lot of things I want to do. Uh, but um, overall, I'm, I'm glad of the decisions that I've made. Great. I think that that's wonderful. And, you know, we do get get wiser with age, I guess, but I, I, with you, there are a lot of things I still want to do. <laughs> I want more time to do them. Uh, Karen, are there other? Uh, Laura? Yeah. You... yeah. Um, 
Thank you. And yeah, Sharon, you're very brave. But anyway, um, here's a nice question. It's, um, I always love to know what people are currently reading or listening to, or a book that was life changing. So could each, um, could each awardee just name one work that you're reading now or one that's been important to you? Well, I'll jump, jump right in here. Uh, I'm reading President Obama's book right now, which is just amazing. And I love it to pieces. My daughter just gave me The Beekeeper of Aleppo, which is a wonderful book. And then I, right before that, I finished From the Ashes. It was given to me by a doctoral student that had done some research for me. And she's from Canada. And it's about a young man who had a history of addiction and he went on to overcome that and become a uh, professor in Canada. And the book is amazing. So his name was Jesse Thistle. Um, and I encourage you to, any one of those books is just wonderful. I read so much, life-changing. I probably can't answer that one right this minute without thinking about it, but thank you. Great answer. Who else? Um, I, yeah, I finished Promised Land, uh, President Obama's book last month, and it was just wonderful. It was really good. Um, I'm currently reading Reviving Ophelia, and I can't remember um, the doctor's name who wrote it, but uh, I am reading that because I am raising teenage girls in a pandemic. <laughs> and it's it's very, very helpful. It's, it's a great book about the, you know, pressures and you know, everything facing adolescent girls and how we protect their spirits and guide them into womanhood. That sounds great. Yeah. Sharon, do you have a book that you want to? Well, I read all the time and I like fiction primarily, but I read a little bit of everything. I just, I've just finished uh, the Thursday Murder Club, which is about people and old people in retirement. Uh, community solving murders, uh, but it's not, it was incredibly entertaining, but not exactly life changing. But I would put in a plug for a book, Women, I received in the mail yesterday um, as a gift from Terry Moore, who was a previous Marianne Hartman Award winner. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sinking my teeth into that. I've been taking notes. I'll try to get to some of those books. But there are just so many great books to read. Here, just, Laura, is there any other questions? You know what? There are some wonderful questions, but I think we need to start winding up. So, Mary, yeah. I will say thank you to everyone and let you close the, the panel. Thank you. I want to say thank you to the panelists, the awardees, and each one of you is inspiring. One thing about the Marianne Hartman Awards, I've said that over the years, they are frequently uh, women who are nominated and honored that I didn't know about beforehand. I mean, all of you I, I was familiar with in your work, but it's, it's just amazing how inspiring every one of the awardees has been over the years that I've been attending these award ceremonies. I wish that now we could say everyone will gather in the other room for a wonderful buffet meal and socializing and hugging. And we can't do that tonight, but you've all been wonderful answering the questions. And I know we've had a great audience who've been pleased. Thank you so much to Laura Cowan, Dr. Cowan and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies have put in so many hours trying to make this award presentation work well um, through the magic of technology, which is what the university has for us to use now. And we all look forward to next year having you come back and having a live in-person uh, ceremony that time next March for Women's History Month. But special thanks also to the Marianne Hartman Awards Committee who meet, who read all the wonderful, wonderful applications we have and uh, answer and put down questions. And then to the Alumni Association for 
co-sponsoring with us uh, because with Asia and Ethan and John Diamond, the head of the Alumni Association, they have done so much of the work to prepare for this evening and it's it's gone really well considering that I know nothing about technology. And thanks to all the speakers who were pre-recorded but gave great talks and congratulations again to Claudia and Neely on their awards that you heard from them earlier and they were incredible young women. So we all have a lot to be hopeful for and a lot to celebrate. And I will close with that and see if Laura has any further words for us. Uh, thank you again. Now, I encourage you all to listen to the closing music from Renaissance and to look at the credits because there are people that we are thanking in the credits. Thank you.